Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor van Selst, dear Bath, I think it's easier if we call each other by our first names. Welcome in the auditorium of our beautiful university. My name is Rianne Letschert and I'm the Rector Magnificus of the university. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you this very young, energetic colleague. And he, I'm not sure if you already heard it, but I always have some spies in the faculty. And since I am also a professor in law, I have many spies in the law school, much more than in the other faculties. And I always need these spies to get some information about our newly appointed professors in order to be able to say a few words about you. So I will do that first, and then I will give you the floor. So don't get nervous. If I get really like the details that you don't want to share in public, then I, of course, will not do that. But I was, of course, impressed very much when our, your CV was presented to us in the, the board of the deans, since you are one of the leading lawyers in international arbitration law in the Netherlands. And along with your expertise and your very fresh ideas, I think it is also your practical experience being an active lawyer yourself, which is quite important also for our law school, but also for the entire university. And I will come to that in a minute. Now, Bas has been teaching dispute resolution since last November here at our university. And before that, he has taught and coordinated international arbitration at the University of Amsterdam, Radboud University in Nijmegen, and also at the University of Law and Policy in Lahore in Pakistan, I was told. And, and not the least, also a visiting researcher at the Harvard Law School and the University of British Columbia. These are not the least universities, I can say. So you have had a rapid development, both as a lawyer and as an academic. You earned your PhD in European private law from the University of Amsterdam in 2008. And back then you were rather critical of businesses. But afterwards you went on to work for Van Dorne, a prestige, prestigious law firm on the famous Zuidas, representing a broad range of businesses in high-stake litigation cases. Your promoter at the time joked that you were going to work for the enemy. But we'd like to think that you did so as a spy, maybe rather than as a deserter. Seriously, though, your career exemplifies how that close contact to practice actually enhances research. And that research's ultimate goal also isn't knowledge for its own sake, but also to have an influence on practice. And I think also at our university and at the law school in particular, we are proud of our contribution to society. Your skill set spans so both of these fields, academia and practice. You have to be subjective to take your client's side. You enjoy a good fight, I've been told, at least when we talk about litigation. Eh? But you're also interested in resolving disputes. While certainly competitive, like every good lawyer, you are always interested in getting to the bottom of the issue at hand. As an academic, you are objective, keen to present all aspects of arbitration law to your students. They told me that they very much appreciate your skills, but also the passion with which you present the most complex subject matters in the classroom. You combine enthusiasm and an engaging manner with first-hand experience from high-profile cases. And that's actually what our students are very fond of, in that particular combination. Both communities, and then I mean Van Dorne and the university, also appreciate your interest in the technological aspects of law and the effects artificial intelligence might have. I know that, by volume, eBay is the biggest judge in the world and that the arbitration cases between their buyers and sellers are decided largely through automated decision-making. This is obviously, I think, to all of us, intriguing and has an amazing potential. Although hopefully, and I speak maybe for everyone, it won't potentially make academics or arbitration lawyers or lawyers in general redundant. You have started looking into the possibilities, the limitations and the biases of such systems. And during your stay as visiting researcher at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver last year, you looked at the Civil Resolution Tribunal, which relies heavily on automated decision making. Apparently only 2% of the cases eventually end up in court. Now, at this university, we find this particularly, particularly interesting with our Institute of Data Science, and we hope that you will take UM to the cutting edge of this particular application 
of automated decision making. No pressure there, huh? but that's a, a wish that, that we have. Now, judging by your vlog, yes, he's also vlogging, your stay in Vancouver was also emblematic for your focus and your drive. Although Canada is 250 times the size of the Netherlands, you restricted yourself to a city the size of Amsterdam, and even there, mostly the library and the university. Still, you were charmed by the gentleness of the Canadians, such as their politeness and positivity, that it extends even to the prohibitions. Stay off the grass, stay on the path. And you even found the hiding place of Michael Jackson, you were saying in your, in your vlog. Who would have thought that? Now, I don't know where your journey will take you, boss, but I do know that our current Minister of Justice, Ferdinand Schrapperhuis, also got a PhD in law from the UvA, has been practicing as a lawyer whilst being a part-time professor here at Maastricht University. Just an idea. But for now, I want to congratulate you on this chair. I wish you all the best, and I hope you will enjoy your time here in Maastricht. We are very happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Rector, Rihanna, for your kind words and for offering me the opportunity to speak before this academic community gathered here today. I'm, of course, also most interested in learning about your sources, but uh, let us now first discuss perspectives and thoughts on automation in dispute resolution, because that's the title of this lecture. Please allow me to kick off with a small survey, which admittedly is statistically insignificant. Um, just by show of hands, who would in this room would take medication prescribed by a computer without any human intervention? Yeah. And who would not do that? Okay, and it's just for the people in the front, most of the people in the back uh, would, would not do this. Just an, another example. Uh, a plane that only has an autopilot. It flies itself, again, entirely without human intervention. No pilots on the plane. Who would board that plane? And who would not? He was just too lazy to raise his hand. <laughs> oh, there's uh, someone in the back there. I expected it was you. Um, <clears throat> no, of course, these questions cannot be answered in binary fashion, not at all. Uh, that's the reason why I asked them. Uh, there's all sorts of nuances varying from uh, questions over intrinsic reliability of systems to external factors. One could think of hacking having a negative impact on safety and on the system. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Today, I would like to discuss thoughts and perspectives on what are the nuances to be considered in the context of automation in the administration of justice, civil justice more particularly. Now, this discussion will also be the subject of a more elaborated version of this lecture, um, including an assessment of the effects of automated dispute resolution on the efficacy of European private law, uh, which is to be published in the Maastricht Law Series later this year. Now, for now, <clears throat> Let us focus on a more general assessment of the topic. I only have about 45 minutes, I've been told, so I'll try and stick to that time. It's been submitted that the implementation of technological innovations in dispute resolution reduces error and improves consistency in legal decision making. It's also considered to be cost and time efficient and to benefit access to justice. Now, an issue that has received little exposure, remarkably, as far as I'm concerned, is that of the impact of automation on the rights adjudicated. In other words, does dispute resolution by a computer reap the same results as procedures conducted by human actors? I will assess this question today from three angles, computer sciences, cognitive and social psychology, and experiences with automation in the context of US administrative law. And these analyses give various reasons to doubt whether computers will be able to produce results that befit our current ideas of justice, both substantively and procedurally. Against this brown, background, I submit that we should not focus on seeking ways in which computers may be deployed in the administration of justice. Rather, I argue, we should focus on an assessment of which issues in the administration of justice may be resolved by the increased use of technology and, and at what costs, or what are the costs of using technology in dispute resolution. Now, let me elaborate my position as follows. <clears throat> First, where do we stand? What's the current status of technological developments in dispute resolution? When we talk or read about the application of technology in dispute resolution, we tend to see this as something of the future. Fact of the matter is, however, 
that the developments in the field have been ongoing for over 20 years now. A field in which technology is increasingly employed is that of online dispute resolution, ODR, abbreviated. Historically, ODR systems have been designed as communication platforms aimed at facilitating alternative dispute resolution, or ADR. More particularly, ODR takes away the need for physical presence at a meeting or a hearing, thereby increasing cost effectiveness of ADR. Now, history and futures of ODR platforms. The development of ODR platforms commenced as early as the mid-1990s. The first commercial ODR applications emerged quickly. As early as, as 2004, an estimated 115 private ODR providers were in business, uh, but this number had decreased to about 40 by 2010. The website odr.info currently lists around 70 providers of online dispute resolution services. Now, most of these services offer a web-based form, which allows users to attempt to resolve differences between themselves. Essentially, the disputants negotiate online. The algorithm underlying the system monitors these negotiations and may provide suggestions for possible outcomes or solutions. And disputants may choose to accept the suggested outcome or proceed in the process. Where necessary, parties may choose to escalate the dispute to a mediator or arbitrator. And this third party may facilitate amicable discussion, suggest a solution, and or render a decision. Now, a service provider that's often referred to in literature on ODR is Modria. Modria is an online dispute resolution tool aimed at the resolution of common, generally small claims. It's a spin-off of eBay and PayPal's resolution centers. And in the past 20 years, these resolution centers have processed hundreds of millions of cases, largely about 90%, through fully automated procedures that do not require human intervention. So it's nice to discuss Modria because it's a kind of exemplary for how this works. Um, so how does it work then? Um, Modria claims to be capable of handling all manner and volume of cases, from simple debt cases to complex child custody matters to eviction cases. Now, it uses a four-stage process. Going through the motions, the process develops from a party-controlled complaint process, right, that's stage one, to a process managed by a third-party neutral, <clears throat> that is stage two. And then the third stage of the process includes a third-party mediator, so he's between the parties still. Um, and in case the matter is not resolved at this stage, um, a third-party arbitrator renders a decision, as, as it follows from this picture, um, that arbitrator is above the parties. He, he, he makes an arbitral award, which may, uh, if necessary, be enforced through the courts. Now, some private ODR platforms provide their own enforcement tools. A party not willing to comply with the outcome of the process may, for instance, see its account suspended. Other enforcement tools include other users being allowed to post negative feedback, delay of payment, or the application of charges. Now, these means of compliance, payment mechanisms in particular, are often heralded as essential features of successful private ODR platforms. So, what's next, one might ask? Although it's submitted that it's unlikely that human oversight can be fully removed from legal decision-making systems, recent developments suggest otherwise. Like Modria, there's an increasing number of other platforms that provide dispute resolution services that do not require the involvement of a human actor. And these developments, I must note, represent a fundamental shift from ODR as a web-based communications tool to an intelligent system, an algorithm designed to assist settlements by suggesting outcomes or maybe even make decisions itself. Now, the furthering of these technologies is at the same time considered a necessary evil and vital to the survival of these platforms. A necessary evil, as technological development increases the access to justice potential of the platform. Also, technological development may help mitigate hindrances due to the, un uh, sorry, due to the uncertainty created by the newness of the system and the lack of enforcement mechanisms. On the other hand, technological development is vital as a cost reduction strategy. Costs associated with the maintenance, upkeep, and service of ODR platforms are widely considered a threat to their long-term survival. And strong evidence for this position can be derived from the large turnaround in the number of available platforms I just discussed. This seems congruent to the difficulty of passing on costs to users in low-value cases, which is what these platforms focus on. Now, I've just focused on automation in the field of private dispute resolution. However, swelling court dockets, shrinking budgets, 
and rising concerns about access to justice also provide incentives for governments to investigate the potential of automation in the public domain. The challenges faced by ODR platforms provide valuable insights in the discussion over the desirability and feasibility of automated dispute resolution in public courts. Against this background, uh, and in view of the importance of state uh, courts, at least as providers of residual access to justice, let us consider three perspectives relevant to the discussion. <clears throat> First, the perspective of computer science. From the field, I draw three challenges to automation. First, jurisprudential, secondly, technical, and thirdly, political challenges. Um, and I will discuss them in this order. Jurisprudential challenges. Now, the systems that are envisaged to play a part in the administration of justice are based on the, I, I should say, oversimplified idea that one can extract applicable rules from a body of law, translate in them into a formalism that a computer can read and process, and then uh, something comes out at the end, and then that's justice, right? Um, well, the positive notion of law as a formal rule-governed process that allows for the mechanical application of a mere set of rules has, however, been challenged on fundamental grounds. Torkin has submitted that legal reasoning is not a deductive rule-based exercise. He argues that the law consists not only of rules, but also of principles. And rules are applicable in an all-or-nothing fashion, whereas principles have the extra dimension of relative weight, making them, and I quote, not even in theory subject to enumeration. Now, proponents of automation have sought to address this critique by pointing to the fact that Dworkin's position does not challenge the notion that, at least in clear cases, legal questions may be decided by the application of rules. After all, Dworkin does not challenge that the law does provide a right answer to each question of law. The law being, at least to some extent, determinate and capable of generating a right answer is not a universally accepted notion. I note with some euphemism. It has been challenged by the legal realist movement of the 1920s. Rejecting the then dominant role of formalism, the legal realists argued that legal rules cannot guide courts to definite results in particular cases. Now, the critical legal studies movement and the new re legal realists have furthered this uh, discussion and argued uh, that there is a lack of determinative meta principles in law. Now, what does this boil down to? I would say, this lack of determinability poses a serious jurisprudential challenge to automation in dispute resolution. After all, if it's not clear what is the law, how can a computer be programmed to apply it? That brings me to the second issue, technical challenges. <coughs> Apart from the question whether computer systems could theoretically provide right answers to legal questions, automated decision-making faces technical challenges. For rule-based systems, these challenges lie in the impossibility of incorporating all relevant consideration uh, into the system. In other words, it's impossible to encode all factors that may play a part in a legal decision into a system, into a code. Now, assuming that it can be established what factors in our uh, complex legal systems are relevant to the outcome of a case, the large number of such factors is likely to lead to decreased transparency and explanatory capability may make it impossible for human actors to comprehend, to understand the outcome proposed or defined by a system. And I will get back to, to that in a bit. Um, thirdly, as all practicing lawyers know very well, and I have a suspicion that there's quite a couple of them here today, um, the law is about the facts. And to put it more precisely, maybe from an academic standpoint, practicing lawyers, I would uh, say, share the experience that it's the facts that disputants tend to differ about and not necessarily the law. Discussions on automation and dispute resolution fail to incorporate this challenge of computers not being capable to decide on what has or has not happened, uh, and in a particular situation, who bears the burden of proof. And lastly, a technical aspect that's often overlooked is that of changing social norms, how to incorporate those into the system. Our views on what is to be considered reasonable, appropriate, or even lawful change over time. Think about women's or gay routes and how they have developed in the last 100 years, 50 years, 25 years, or maybe even the last five years. Now, this brings the question, to what extent computer systems are capable of incorporating changing social norms? That brings me to the third challenge from uh, the perspective of computer science. And that's a challenge of a political nature. Most writings on computerization of legal processes focus on technical and economic issues. 
Now, this focus on technicalities seems to me incongruent to the recognition of the phenomenon of automation bias. And basically, automation bias, and I quote, is the fact that behind software programs are individuals with values and preferences and whose choices are grounded in their own worldview and reflect societal power structure and individual biases. Now, to put this in an example, when you are driving, um, or be be better, you sit back in your self-driving car, and the car senses an accident is going to happen, um, it will decide to either run into the tree or into the old lady. Now, whatever decision the car makes, and whomever you feel the car should run into, and we're not having a survey on that, um, there's someone that has programmed the car to act the way it does. And that engineer has a certain view of the world, which may be reflected in the algorithm. Now, if we tra transpose this to the law, automation bias gives rise to concerns as to whether the algorithms deployed in dispute resolution are and will in the future adequately reflect substantive laws adjudicated through such systems. And these concerns arise at hypothetically two levels. First, those involved in the development of robo-judges may be inclined to build the system in such a way that it makes decisions coinciding with their values. And I hope this picture makes clear that it may be of relevance who is the engineer that builds the system. <laughs> now, it's irrelevant whether the engineer would have pecuniary or ideological reasons to shape the system the way it is. And in fact, this may be the same thing altogether, maybe for this guy. Um, the point is, the engineer becomes a judge by proxy, and this quite clearly, I would say, is in contravention of the democratic constitutional tradition, which requires transparency both with respect to who applies and uh, the law and how it is applied. <coughs> but it might go even further. So it might be that deep learning is developed in such a way that it may adjudicate cases and develop its own view of the law on a standalone basis. Here, the developer of the system cannot be called upon to explain how his or her machine works. So assuming the person in the picture does understand how the system works, uh, when we get to deep learning, he might not be able to understand the system because the, the system has developed, so to speak, away from the developer. And although this may be a rather far-fetched prospect, I hope so, I would say, it does invite more current questions relating to what is the level of transparency required in computer systems and how this transparency should be communicated. In other words, who are these engineers that develop the decision-making systems that may be deployed in dispute resolution? Should these people be democratically elected? Or should we just school judges to write software? Which is not something I would go for, but that's a personal opinion. Um, in summary, from the field of computer sciences, various challenges to automation in the administration may be, uh, of justice may be drawn. And these challenges are likely to affect the substantive outcome of automated dispute resolution processes, but have not, I should say, or only very limitedly been subject of discussions in the legal context. That brings me to the social sciences. First of all, I'd like to discuss the interrelation between um, the combined involvement of humans and automation. And this phenomenon is called human system interaction, or HSI. Now, HSI has attracted ample attention in a number of academic disciplines in the field of pharmacology, for instance, Research has been conducted on the influence of new technologies on errors in the prescribing process. And the people that voted yes probably are not aware of this research, but they're still fine with the computer uh, uh, prescribing their medication. Um, and in aviation psychology, the same applies. It's been assessed whether using, for instance, two pilots can help mitigate the risks associated with the use of an autopilot. Lastly, also in the more legalistic, if I may, fields of risk and compliance and credit scoring, the influence of the application of technology has been scrutinized. Now this leads me to discuss findings from the field of cognitive psychology focusing on this H HSI phenomenon. Also, I'd like to discuss the acceptability of computerized decision dispute resolution from the perspective of social psychology. First, the human factor in automation, human system interaction. In a 1997 article, Pesuriman and Riley reviewed 120 papers related to human system interaction. They set up a model in which mismatches in human system interaction were characterized in terms of use, disuse, misuse, and abuse of automation. Now, to start with the first, the use of automation. Suriman and Riley note that a fundamental reason for the use of automation is the reduction of human workload and the reduction of risks of error. 
And contrary to what one might expect, however, automation often does not reduce workload. And this may be explained by high-level automated systems often being engaged in probabilistic environments. So this leads the human actor to spend considerable time in, put simply, checking the results of the system. And as this checking is time-consuming, the human operator may prefer to perform the tasks manually. In the legal context, judges may choose to write awards themselves, as it takes too much time to check the award the computer generates. Misuse is somewhere on the other side of the spectrum. It refers to various aspects in which operators rely on poorly operating automation. And this over-reliance can result from various forms of human act, uh, error. For instance, uh, a human operator may fail to recognize automation breakdowns. This is called a monitoring failure. And also, the human operator may too easily accept the computer-generated result. This is referred to as decision bias. And although these effects may be mitigated by means of training practices, also skilled operators, it follows from research, may show misplaced faith in the accuracy of the outcome of the automation. In other words, also trained judges may be inclined to just put their signature under computer-generated awards, which they assume to be correct, because that's what the computer tells them. It seems safe to assume this risk is only increased where the judge is pressurized to render awards as swiftly and as economically efficiently as possible. Now, this use, thirdly, concerns situations where automation is not employed, although it could enhance performance. This use may appear where automation is perceived as as threatening to the status quo, in cases of lack of functionality in automation, or the lack of developed trust in the automation's capabilities. Moreover, false alarms, warnings that are perceived to be given by the system too frequently, may also have a deterring effect on the use of automation. Now, whether this is a realistic mismatch in the legal context remains to be seen, in particular where judges, as discussed before, are put on tight budgets. Now, abuse, lastly, is described as, and I quote, the automation of functions by designers and implementation by managers without due regard for the consequences for human and hence system performance and the operator's authority over the system. Basurim and O'Reilly know that abuse may be a consequence of focus on technical and economic factors in automation without sufficient attention for human performance in the resulting system. This is, if I may anticipate my conclusion, a particular concern in the current debate on the application of technology in the administration of civil justice. Now, I do concede that bias may work both ways. A, a human adjudicator may be prone to, unintentionally or not, favor tall over short, male over female, or, I'm afraid sadly more current, white over black disputants. That does, however, not take away from the relevance of the findings I just discussed. Rather, to the contrary, there's ample evidence to show that computerization may lead to bias, amongst others, as the data deployed by computer systems may be inherently biased. That brings me to procedural fairness, findings from social psychology. Um, it says, what makes one accept the decision, um, let alone what makes one accept the decision as fair? And proponents of automation and dispute resolution have focused on what is presented as objective benefits of automation cost savings, consistency, access to justice, reduction of error are the main arguments. Now, in the field of social psychology and sociology, a vast literature has developed on how legal systems are perceived subjectively. In simplified terms, what makes one accept a decision? Leventhal has proposed that in an individual's perception of fairness, six fairness factors play a part. Consistency, bias suppression, accuracy of information, correctability, representativeness, and ethicality. Tyler has suggested an alternative framework in which the primary factors determinative of legal fairness are, one, the possibility for a disputant to participate in the process, secondly, the honesty, impartiality, and objectivity of the authorities, three, trust in the third party authority responsible for resolving the case, and four, the degree to which the disputants are treated respectfully. Now, um, one could question whether automation or automated dispute resolution ranks favorably on these parameters. Now, Thornton submits it does. He points to recent technological developments entailing that legal decision systems are not, and I quote, necessarily more restrictive of participant expression than their manual counterparts. If I had to phrase this more simply, I understand him as saying, modern computer systems do not just offer drawdown menus, 
but humanoid chatbots that should offer a comparable experiences to being in an actual online court room with a human judge. Um, I don't mean to be judgmental, but this sounds like an argument from someone that has never actually been in a courtroom. Um, moreover, Thornton submits, a well-documented driver, and I think this is true, not considered in the frameworks proposed by Leventhal and Tyler, is that of promptness and lack of delay in legal processes. In short, disputants tend to perceive a system that resolves matters more swiftly to also be more fair. In summary, from social and cognitive psychology, um, the following suggestions may be drawn. First, that perils of human interaction with computer systems are likely to be of influence on the outcome of a computer-assisted or computer-generated decision. And secondly, that one should not too easily assume computer-generated decisions will meet with the same level of acceptance as do decisions rendered by humans. That brings me to experiences in US administrative law. And I must note, uh, uh, my esteemed colleague Jacobin van der Brink will speak on administrative law later today, so uh, if you want to hear something sensible about that, stay in the room. Uh, I'd now like to uh, talk a bit about uh, computerized law in action, as Pound would call it. In this respect, uh, the developments in administrative law in the United States provide useful insights. In fact, most of us here have dealt with it. I think most of us have, in the past, requested the so-called uh, electronic travel authorization for traveling to the U.S., and such a request, um, and I don't mean to scare you, but is processed without human intervention with the use of algorithms and what is referred to as big data. Now, it's just an example of an administrative law system in which the computer has become the primary decision maker. It's been submitted that this process of automation has generated unforeseen problems for the adjudication of individual rights. This has prompted the question whether existing procedural legal structures are capable of managing the automation process. And it has been noted that, and I quote, the opacity of automated systems prevents an easy determination of the source of an error that the system might make. Um, and this gives rise to three concerns with respect to effective judicial or regulatory review um, that I'd like to discuss with you now. First, how to appeal a computer-generated decision. It may be difficult to assess the odds of succeeding on appeal on the basis of a computer-generated decision, and this may deter a disputant from seeking recourse to a higher authority. Secondly, how to handle an appeal of a computer-generated decision. Should a disputant choose to commence proceedings um, um, to a higher authority, then opacity of the reasons underlying the disputed outcome may pose a problem for the appeals court to assess the source of the error. What is this appeals court going to do? Is it going to check these two, two million lines of code? No, it's not likely to. Uh, but how is it then going to assess the outcome of the computer-generated decision? Um, and that thirdly leads to the question, how to ensure the next computer-generated decision is better? In cases of success on appeal, difficulties are likely to arise in amending the erroneous parts of the code, causing concerns as to continued incorrect application of the law in other cases. Now, as such, experiences with computer-generated dispute resolution lead to questions over the compatibility of our existing procedural mechanisms with the requirements of computerized decision-making. I'm slightly early, I think, but I, uh, I hope you're fine with me coming to a conclusion now. Um, the foregoing assessment gives rise to concerns, amongst others, with respect to a, the compatibility of automated decision-making with existing substantive and procedural norms. Two, market pressures incentivizing unbalanced algorithms, automation bias. And three, more generally, perils of human interaction with automation, such as decision bias, complacency, and monitoring failures. And these concerns are exacerbated by a lack of judicial and regulatory supervision of automated decision-making systems. As a consequence, there is, I conclude, a large likelihood that results generated by or with the help of automation are to differ from the outcomes produced by our current adjudicative mechanisms. And that's not, and that's not an answer to the question, should we proceed with automation? It's just uh, an observation. Um, what's also an observation is that I disagree with the assessment by Suskin that, and I quote, on the face of it, there are no knockdown objections, no overriding concerns of law or principle that should call a halt to the ongoing and advanced computerization of courts." End of quote. Based on what I just discussed, 
It seems to me the debate on what constitutes an overriding concern of principle, or even of law for that matter, is in its infancy, and any conclusions on this issue are premature. Although we're getting more and more familiar with its increasing benefits, we have not even begun to fathom the societal impact the automation of dispute resolution mechanisms may have. Also, we do at, th at this point not sufficiently understand what's the impact of automation in dispute resolution on the acceptance of computer-generated decisions, on the efficacy of appeal proceedings, and on the availability of human judges as well, residual access to justice. And these findings suggest that a further assessment of these and other issues is vital to a reasoned discussion of the pros and cons of automation in the administration of justice. It is these assessments that I envisage to, contri to contribute to in both my capacities. It is, after all, in furthering society through debate, reasoned debate, I should add, where the roles of the academic and the practicing attorney converge. Now, please allow me to wrap up this lecture with a few words of appreciation to those who have helped me making it possible to speak to you today. First, Madam Rector, let me thank the University of Maastricht for establishing this chair in dispute resolution. Um, and I will do everything within my ability to warrant my appointment and to further discussion in the chair's field of focus. Secondly, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Law and its Department of Private Law. Now, as, of course, the department is only a construct of organizational psychology, I more particularly thank the people in that department that have so warmly welcomed, and this is very much true, welcomed me in their midst. It's an absolute joy to work with such a wonderful group of people so deeply committed to research, to teaching, and to engaging our students in every other possible way. Thank you to Van Dornen for facilitating my extra extracurricular, or maybe I should say intracurricular activities. I'm proud to be part of a firm that chooses not to rigorously apply the modern day hours times rate mantra that so many of the other larger firms live by. And I've noted that the old man's not here, so I can safely say this. <laughs> uh, this fits well with Van Dorna's rich history of service to the local and national bar association, to its history of promoting the availability of legal services to those who do not have access to it, and with its commitment to a large number of societal causes such as Weekend School, Weekend School, and the Futsalbank. Oh, and guys and girls of the sixth floor, I should thank you for your acceptance. Frankly, it surprises me every day. <laughs> Mom and Dad, thank you for your continuous support of my tendency to do things exactly opposite of the way you've taught. As both Federer and Manasse showed that exact same tendency at four years of age, and that's four years combined, I'm afraid it's stuck in the genes. Lastly, thank you, Mariska, for sharing this experience with me and for following me wherever our joint journeys have brought us. So far, I would like to add. If I look at this room as a sky full of stars, you are the Northern Light. Ik heb gezegd. Thank you very much, Professor Van Sels. That does sound very good, doesn't it? Dear boss, I, th I think this was a fascinating uh, inaugural lecture on a topic that I also believe every law student should get, whatever field of law you are studying. I think it is of utmost importance that everyone also understands the complexities that you have shared with us, also so interdisciplinary. I can understand why Jan said we need this man. You fit our profile so so well, being very good in your own discipline, but also so interdisciplinary and so international and so well in uh, talking to our audience that well, I wasn't, I needed, didn't need to be convinced, but after listening to you here today, there is no doubt that you belong here at our university. So please, again, uh, good luck with the rest of your career at our university. And I would like to emphasize also again, knowing you will be here only one day a week, uh, that I hope you will also find some time to extend your activities to our other faculties and our campuses who are working a lot on data science. And I think they really need also lawyers like you to participate in uh, these developments. I think that's actually crucial. So thank you again very much. That also brings us to the end of this academic ceremony.
Uh, that means that we will go now to the Refter, which is our reception area. We probably will be able to be outside, which is kind of nice because it's always hot in this auditorium. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend. And uh, for those of you that will be able to stay, I hope it will be as sunny as it was the rest of the week. Thank you very much. <laughs>